Hi, welcome. I am Chaitanya Atle and this is the Cellular Biophysics course which we're going to go on a journey with into an understanding of quantitative biology through exploring concepts in physics, examples in biology and a blending of the two. Now, in a sense, the large goal of this course is really to ask and answer the question how physics can answer the how and why of cell biology. But I hope you will also find that we are not just restricted to cells because the principles that apply at the cellular scale, I hope you will see, apply at higher scales too and at smaller scales too. That is to say intracellular as well as multicellular. Now we won't be touching on organismal biology for the limits of constraint of this course, but we will indicate where things apply into more higher scale problems and for those of course you need to take other courses. So uh, in this spirit, um, I just want to introduce myself a little bit. I am Chaitanya Atle, I am an associate professor at ISA Pune. Um, I have been in this place since 2009. Prior to this I was a postdoctoral research fellow in the cell biology and biophysics unit. Before that I was a postdoc in Mass General Hospital in the Harvard Medical School. And before that, I did my PhD in Germany. Uh, that was 2003. Uh, my background uh, has uh, been a bit diverse. I worked as a teaching assistant at the University of Bern in Switzerland for a year or two. Uh, before that, I did a master's in zoology. Now, you will really wonder what is a zoologist doing, doing teaching biophysics, and I hope you will see the answer to that question. Um, I also did a BSc in botany. Uh, now, this is sort of important for me to say it because it's not to say that you should be this, but to also point you to the idea that quantitative biology is for biologists as well as physicists and you can be from a biology background and learn some of these tools and I hope and you will see during the progression of this course that these tools and these approaches and these concepts logic are very powerful and when used wisely with some understanding can give you great benefits in understanding fundamental biology, biological questions like why do animals uh, behave the way they do why do birds fly the way they do? Why is evolution driven in the way it is? And the kind of questions that as a biologist you think are most important. Um, and so broadly, the overview of today's lecture is that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where you will find the material um, and then we'll jump to a few questions. And I think it's very important for you to realize that without questions, science is kind of pointless. So we're going to ask the why, why do we study biophysics? what to expect from this course and what the course contents actually are. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit also a little bit about what your background is likely to be. Now this is an NPTEL course. This means that many of you may be watching it with very diverse backgrounds. You may be a humanities student, you may be a school student. I don't know that. But I do expect a certain amount of prior knowledge when you come into this course. So even if you are a, a 12th standard or first year BSc student in uh, uh, so, uh, in sociology, if you learn some of these prerequisites, then you will make more sense and gain more from this course. Naturally, the target is typically a uh, biology and physics, natural sciences background. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about organizational at, uh, issues of attendance, assessment and interaction, um, originality, assessment and the P word. And by P word, I think many of you probably guessed this. Uh, in the academic context, plagiarism, right? Um, I will end this session with some pointers to books and references and what I hope you will learn from this course if you actually finish it. Okay, so let's dive straight into this. Um, the broad web based information is available on the NPTEL website. This is where you are accessing this course, but I will also post some material on my own uh, institute website under the rubric of teaching and if you go to this, navigate to this page here um, that is isapune.ac.in and uh, tilde c atle, you will land on this page and be able to see some of this information. So it so happens that when we ask a question, why should we study a subject, this can give you a very diverse set of opinions and uh, some of those opinions may not be very useful. Um, so I'll try to be useful and I'll also try to explain to you the motivation is not new. Uh -huh. um, so 
for me, one of the most important answers to the question why study cellular biophysics is that whether we can even use physical principles to explain evolution. We are intrigued about ourselves, we are intrigued as humans, we are intrigued about the coevolution of symbiotes like all the gut bacteria, we are intrigued about dogs, cats, how they evolved to be with us, cows that domesticate were domesticated by us, but also other animal and plant and microorganismal life, which in a sense form our entire ecosystem. So, are there any principles? Is it just that in order to understand biology, you need to go into the field and classify every butterfly there is? And my view on this matter is that there are some principles, they are hard to get, they are uh, important to get, but you need investigation. And the hard work that people have done, this is what we are going to talk about in this course. Therefore, I think studying biophysics is important. And uh, this picture I have put uh, in this corner here uh, is the cover of an original Latin book uh, by Galileo Galilei. Now, many of you are probably physics students and you are very familiar with classical mechanics, celestial mechanics and the foundation of modern physics in some of the ideas of Galileo. Galileo incidentally was a revolutionary guy. <laughs> he, uh, uh, he did not look like a revolutionary, he did not wear a cap or some funny cap. He was revolutionary because he asked questions and he asked questions and gave answers. Those answers at the time when he gave them were against the dogma of the priesthood of that time. And that made some of his answers unfortunately um, considered to be heretic. He was asked to recant, he was asked to take back what he said. Um, but the work that he did stands the test of time. And for us as scientists, this is the most important that you may disagree, people may disagree, but the test of time is the best test of any scientific discovery, concept or law that we may put together. And in this uh, uh, Discorsiae Demonstratione Mathematice, uh, he discussed mathematical and uh, demonstrations, uh, discourses on demonstrations of mathematical laws of nature, um, which amongst other things told us something about evolution. And I will touch a little bit upon it when I talk about um, mechanics and you will be surprised how Galileo was so far ahead of his time. Um, I will also try to answer to you um, questions about things that again 1890, this is not a history lesson, but this is just to tell you that people have been asking these kind of questions and been curious about them for a very long time. We are looking at 1638, uh, 1890. Uh, with Luigi Galvani, who showed that a frog's leg when connected to a pile, basically copper, aluminum uh, combined with some acid making a primitive battery would give you stimulus response in the leg of a frog. Now, he called it bioelectricity, Volta came along, Alessandro Volta, who then demonstrated that it was probably more due, due to the electricity generated by the battery, not because of biological electricity. But the answer to that question lies somewhere in between in what we today understand as neurophysiology. And uh, so, the point being that people have been curious about this for a while. So, studying it and understanding what they have already discovered and how they discovered it gives us ideas about A, the new principles they found and B, how to approach new problems in the light of the kind of approaches that were very successful. Um, for me, a very exciting study which was theoretical, purely theoretical, which tried to unify all of biology through these kind of physical principles is that of Brown, West and Enquist. Sometimes it is shortened as BWE 1997. So, we have come to this century, well, the previous century now. Um, they asked the question, we see so many different animals. We, we see antelopes on the savanna, we see uh, tigers in the sundarbans, we see little ants in our backyard and in our kitchen sometimes. We see microorganisms under the microscope, we see plants of different sizes, we see tiny one-celled plants up to the gigantic trees in the Himalayas. So, is there anything that connects all of these? And surely, since DNA is common, protein is common, lipids are common, surely there should be some common rules also at a higher scale. So, when they asked this question, they found that not so much the size and volume and uh, mass aspects, but the metabolic rates may be a unifying law across all these scales. Now, for those of you who study physics, you are familiar with this idea of scaling behavior. Uh, for those of you who study mostly biology, 
I will talk a little bit about it uh, because to me it is important to both know the detail and zoom out and see the big picture. And this is what we are going to try to aim to do with the principles we discuss in this course. Now, a book that I find very attractive and every time I try to read it, I never finish, is that by Darcy Wentworth Thompson on growth and form. Now, uh, Wentworth Thompson was a slightly unusual person. He was not a trained engineer, but he had a lot of friends who were engineers at the height of engineering in the United Kingdom in Britain. Um, and he went and tried to ask and borrow the maths that they used to ask whether those can be used to explain how organisms grow from a single cell state. Remember you and I, all human beings listening to this, I mean unless dogs are capable of understanding what we are doing, mostly humans are listening, we were all one cell, right? So how we go from one cell to this very complex being made up of billions of cells along with some symbiotic organisms inside us is a complex question and in a way to my mind one of the biggest questions in biology along with evolution. How does this work, this plan of development work? And so in Darcy Wentworth Thompson's book, he attempted to pull out some of the concepts from 1900s, even 1850s classical mechanics and apply them to some of the biological problems. And these are some of the problems we are going to touch upon. Uh, so to answer my earlier question, why do we study, the, why should we study biophysics of this cellular scale? It is to become familiar with these so that we can now, coming to 2022, the year we are in, make more progress and decide whether some of these principles we can discard because you know just because it's written doesn't mean it's right. So some of the old principles we have to discard, we move on we, because we find evidence, evidence that contradicts it and we find new principles in the process, right. Um, so in some senses, um, people argue that biophysics uh, of this kind is a new area, right. It's a new physical biology, theoretical biophysics, supramolecular level. My claim is and I hope you will see this that it is new and it is not new. What do I mean? I mean that the questions are old but the answers are new because our technical understanding of methodologies of concepts has advanced from the 1800s and 1700s. And putting these things in the new perspective gives us in my opinion a lever on understanding the complexity of biology in a way that we couldn't do before a never before approach and that's what makes me very excited about this area and I hope you will share my excitement as we go along. Now one more question of why is you know biologists study biology, physicists study physics, why mix the two? Yeah? Uh, and part of the reason is that of course for the longest time and many of you probably have professors, researchers you know who were trained in the physics field, uh, physical sciences, De deals with dead material, Bhautik Shastra as sometimes it is called in Hindi, Marathi. Um, but Jaiva Shastra or live material was studied under biology, Bio Logos is the Greek uh, root of this. So what is the point? Uh, so initially most people think okay, physicists will invent an instrument, they will make a microscope, they will make a telescope, they will make a spectroscope and then biologists will apply that and learn something from it. So the information goes from here to there. Uh, but what about the reverse? What about the fact that biological systems are sometimes so strange that things can go from here this way? And this is part of the question that I hope we can address in this course at the end of it when we summarize whether the explanations from biology have led to any new physics at all. Um, my claim to you is yes, but bear with me and be like a good scientist and wait for the evidence and decide for yourself, all right. Um, so I'm going to take a pause here while you admire this beautiful picture of a lizard when we go to the what question of this course.